Good evening, everybody. You're very welcome. Uh, people are just beginning to, to load into the room. Um, so we'll just give everyone a couple of moments to arrive and then we'll get started. So good evening to everybody and you're very welcome to our Bridge Back to School, uh, our autism friendly resource for summer 2020. A special webinar this morning, this evening brought to you by As I Am and by Super Value. And uh, really to promote the resource that we're incredibly proud to have launched together this week along with our colleagues in Mary Immaculate College. And also to have an opportunity really to, to build a little bit further on the content, to give you a bit of guidance on using the resource and supporting your own child in preparing for the return to school. And I think critically, we've brought together the team who published the document this evening. So we have post-primary teachers, uh, primary and post-primary teachers, principals, academics, who are going to, you're going to have an opportunity to directly ask questions of this evening in terms of understanding maybe the own particular concerns you might have about the return to school for your autistic son or daughter. And um, what I will just say, just a little bit of housekeeping at the start, uh, this webinar is being recorded um, and will be available online after this evening. So we'd ask you to just be mindful of that. There is a Q&A box and as we go through the webinar over the next 40 minutes or so, if there's any questions you have for any of our speakers, please type them in the questions box. Um, Michael and Brendan on the team are going to be working to work through those questions and to select a cross section to put to our speakers at the end of the webinar. And we're going to give our Q&A a good 20 minutes because we really feel that's where we can add value this evening. Um, if we don't get your question, of course, please feel free to get in touch with us after uh, the webinar. What I just want to say as well in advance is the Bridge Back to School booklet uh, should now be available in your local Super Value store and is also available on supervalue.ie. And if you were, as we're going through tonight, if you want to join us to see the booklet, you can go to the website and you can open it and you can follow it um, from there. Just before I hand over to our sponsors and Super Value, I just want to say a huge thank you to them for supporting us and bringing this publication together. Since lockdown has happened, uh, we've been working together very hard to try and support the autism community at this difficult time. But one of the things As I Am has been very mindful of is that it's not just about the current restrictions of its challenges. We know the return to school is going to be just as hard as the period out of school. And we wanted to make sure that our community are as supported as possible during that transition. Um, one of the things we've been working on very hard over the last number of weeks is securing the summer provision program. We're very conscious that any program is only beneficial if family members and educators are guided and supporting uh, our young people through this very difficult time. And we're so proud to have produced an evidence-based resource uh, with our colleagues here this evening that we hope will make a difference for your child and for their school community. So without further ado, I just want to briefly introduce who we have here on the call to speak to us this evening. We have Maria Durbin, um, who was the editor of our document reading and is a post-primary or is a primary school teacher in St. Michael's Infant School in Limerick and is also a PhD candidate in Mary Immaculate College uh, in Limerick. We have Judy Durrell, who's corporate communications with Musgrave and a great supporter of As I Am. We've Dr. Margaret Egan of Mary Immaculate College. We've Hannah O'Dwyer, the As I Am Education Officer. We've Dr. Leisha O'Sullivan of Mary Immaculate College. We've Billy Redmond, post-primary principal in Wicklow. We've Anne Jones, who is a home economics and special SPHE uh, teacher and is also the author of 22 textbooks, so very experienced at putting together resources like the one we're talking this evening. And we have Professor Ema Ring, uh, the Dean of Education at Mary Immaculate College, who's really helped us pull together the team here who's on the call tonight and to put the resource together. And we're also supported here tonight by Michael and Brendan from the As I Am team, who are going to keep us on the straight and narrow and make sure all our technology works. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Judy, who's going to just uh, introduce tonight from the point of view of Super Value. 
Hello, everybody. Good evening. And um, thanks, Adam. We've been on a journey for the last couple of years um, with As I Am in an aim to make our stores more autism friendly. And I suppose use the position that we have in the community um, to also make our communities more autism friendly. And we've quite a way to go. Um, even though we feel we've made progress, um, we see every day how much more progress we have to make. So it's a steep learning curve for us. And in the last few years, we focused on our staff, our stores, and then our, our, our partners. Um, we had a lot of plans this year with As I Am um, to do various initiatives. And, and like, like us all, um, when the COVID, COVID pandemic hit, we changed our plans and focused on reducing resources um, through our own channels, which is what we can probably give best to the community is communication and raising awareness around some of the challenges that um, families of autistic people have. Um, so that's the strength of our partnership is raising awareness and using um, consumer channels to do that. So we, we made available a series of resources on how to navigate stores or restrictions through lockdown. We found our customers on a daily basis and our stores challenged. Um, so an even greater challenge for the autism community. Um, and I must say, the, when Adam approached us to look at producing the uh, Bridge Back to School resource um, together with Mary Immaculate, the timeline was very short. So the teams in As I Am and Mary Immaculate um, together have a wonderful expertise and have really worked tirelessly non-stop to produce a, a really expert piece um, of work. Um, the feedback has been phenomenal so far on how practical the resource is. So I hope you do find it very useful um, for all the different users, both parents and children and teachers. Um, and I do want to call out um, both, uh, uh, first of all, Adam for his tireless dedication and constant holding, uh, holding people who are, uh, well, let me say, uneducated in the area and bringing us along. Um, but um, for the wonderful work done in this document, along with Professor Emma Ring, Maria Durban, Dr. Leisha O'Sullivan, Dr. Margaret Egan, Billy Redmond, Anne Jones, Fiona Ferris, and Hanno Dwyer, um, and others again in the team of As I Am. Um, the document is available in store. Um, we have got feedback from some customers saying that stores that they went to didn't have it readily available um, at the service desk, or maybe it maybe a staff member wasn't aware and it could be in the storeroom. It was brought into stores over the weekend. Um, so bear with us. I'd often say to our staff, we have a training program on autism awareness and our main message is being patient. So um, I would ask the autism community to be patient with us um, because we, we didn't step up yesterday and ha hadn't had it available in every store. Um, so we've rang around everybody again today. So you might experience one or two stores not having it. I'm going to give out my email and um, if that does arise and um, feel free to email me we will ensure we've 20,000 copies to distribute um, and we will as long as those 20,000 copies are in the system we send you out the copies so if you can't get it in store my email is julie.dorel at mosgrave there's no s in mosgrave mosgrave.ie um, or else you can go to the supervalue.ie website or the As I Am website to download it. And I hope you get you um, a lot of experts here on the call. So I hope you find the webinar um, as practical as I think it will be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy, and for all your support. Where we want to start this evening is just that we really wanted to create something that was practical. We also wanted to create something that we could stand over and that would meet the needs of the broadest range of people as possible. Because of course, we're catering for a community of people. When we talk about the education system of maybe children as young as four or five, right up to 18 year olds. And that's before we talk about people's individual abilities and needs as well. So we've worked really hard to create a document that's accessible, that's inclusive, and that's evidence-based. So I just want to begin by introducing Ema Ring and Maria Duran, who are going to just take us through the resource and set out how we approach putting it together. Okay, Adam, thank you very much indeed, and good evening, everybody. And just bear with me for a moment. I'm going to share the screen with you, hopefully, uh, that this works. And yes, I hope everyone can see that. So um, 
this is this is the cover of our bridge back to school and as Julie says um, it, it is available uh, in all super value stores and uh, to be patient and it will it will be there um, first of all I just want to say that it has been uh, a, just a great experience to work with such a committed team uh, of people who have so much expertise and commitment um, to this area and we hope and this is truly our hope that you find this resource uh, useful and practical and that was our challenge really at the outset to create a resource that was underpinned by the research in autism and we know in recent years there has been so much really positive research in the area and we wanted to ensure that that was underpinning all we do but also that it could translate easily into practice for autistic children and that it would be used by parents, by teachers, by special needs assistants, by autistic students themselves and anyone who is really supporting an autistic student at this time. We know that children, all children have been impacted uh, by the COVID-19 crisis in terms of the removal of the predictability but we know in particular that children with autism um, have experienced this very differently in terms of their reliance as we all know on predictability and the, uh, the, the main characteristic of this pandemic really has been unpredictability. So um, firstly, I'm just going to um, uh, open the pages for you there. And uh, again, it's very much informed by those voices, the voices of autistic um, individuals and what we know from research and what autistic people are telling us about their experiences. And throughout the booklet, you'll see this QR code and QR code I learned stands for um, quick response. So basically all you do is get your phone and put it over the uh, code and you will find that it will take you to the website. And there's a, a, a range of additional resources available on the website. And also in fact, the bibliography on which this uh, resource is based is available on the, on the website. So very quickly, I'm going to go through the core principles on which the publication is based and it permeates all of the publication and the first is the mosaic approach and by that we mean that there is no unifying theory that that explains everything we know about the differences experienced by autistic children by autistic individuals but what we do know is there is a lot of research in very different areas. So we picked from the mosaic for this publication and you may ask, well, how did you choose to pick? Well, we picked based on what the challenges of transitions are for autistic students. So the areas you can see there that we picked were um, self-care skills, communication and social skills, motor skill development, self-regulation, executive functioning and joint attention but at the heart of the mosaic were the perspectives of autistic uh, individuals because far too long the whole area of autism and research in autism really has been characterized by experts looking in whereas we wanted to look at yes experts looking in because of course that has value but also autistic individuals in terms of autism from the inside out which many of you may be aware and know of the publication that we were involved in at Mary Macleod College um, uh, which was called autism from the inside out so we're very much looking at this from um, if you like um, an autism specific lens and looking at how do autistic uh, children, autistic individuals, how do they see the world and how can we accommodate how they see the world so that we enable each child to achieve his or her potential. So um, the next principle we looked at then was the idea of voice. Now voice in education is very prominent. There's a lot of research in general in education around listening to student voice and what impact it has in terms of student self-confidence in, and increasing their engagement in activities and it's no different for autistic children and by voice we don't mean uh, simply uh, how we speaking and expressing our voice by speaking as I am here but we can know that um, people express themselves in many different ways. They can express themselves by Body language, to gesture, to humming, to I think if you look at um, a, young, a newborn baby and see how from the very beginning when we were born this innate desire that we have as human beings to communicate but then as as guides as facilitators as parents how are we um, listening to what uh, autistic children are communicating to us and how they're communicating to us and really hearing is not the same as listening so what we have to do all of the time is stay tuned in and observe 
and watch for that communication. And finally, the fourth principle is universal design for learning. And this again is not specific to the area of autism, but rather to the area of education in general. And what it means is that we should make all learning experience accessible to all. And how do we do that? Well, we do that by thinking about how we are presenting the learning, how we are enabling uh, children to engage with us, having different ways of engaging, and how we are allowing children to express themselves. And finally, I'm going to uh, just talk very quickly about the area of joint attention because this is an area that there's a lot of research um, in autism currently emerging. And really joint attention means very simply that we all have to be on the same page. If I, if I am um, working with a child, then I need to be aware. And it's a little bit related to staying tuned in and how am I enabling the child to stay tuned in so that we're both on the same page and going in the same direction. So hopefully, I hope that was helpful. And I'm going to pass over now to uh, Maria, who's going to take us quickly to the to the to bridge back to school. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, just bear with me one second. I'm just getting my screen up. I hope you can all see that. Um, thank you very much for having me on this evening. I had the unenviable task of editing this document and when we came together from at the very beginning, we produced a wealth of information from a fabulous team. Um, and then it came to the part where we had to whittle it down to fit into 50 pages, which was very exciting indeed. So that's why, as Ymir says from the very beginning, the QR codes are really important because we have a bank of very valuable information there readily available. So depending on the needs of your the student you're working with or if it is if it's the student themselves they can go online and find more information about that area that they're really interested in so from the very outset uh, you'll see from the front cover we have alex and the team decided to use a gender neutral character that the students autistic students could self-identify with or that the facilitator so we're using the book could provide context for the autistic student throughout the activities and indeed online and alex features in and out of the booklet in different areas. I just, we just felt that it would make it more user friendly to have a character like that there. So from the very outset, as Emer said, we wanted this to be evidence-based. We wanted to approach it from research informed areas, but also it was really important that this would become a very practical resource. We wanted it to be user friendly for everybody that was going to engage with it. So we moved to the idea of having a guide on the side so the autistic student can engage with it, but also a guide on the side. It doesn't matter who it is that is supporting the student. Uh, they should be able to engage with the activities and engage with the text and the guidelines in or around that, that it should be very user friendly. So we hope we've achieved that. So we started, I'm just going to pop through here. We started from a place of strength. The team identified key areas throughout that we, we felt would be really important for that transition time and that movement from distance learning back to, to school. So we decided to use the strengths. So to use that ethos and provide stimulus to help autistic students recognize their own strengths, as well as give guides and facilitators um, some language around those strengths. So to help students to identify their strengths. Sometimes they come in different areas, sometimes they come in different ways. And I think I've included an awful lot of different um, tips and guides there within that strength-based approach to help with this. I think it's really, really important that we do adopt that approach in this and develop confidence and self-esteem in our autistic students. Um, the next area identified was transitions because this is what the whole document was going to be based on, was this bridge between distance learning and back into more structured schooling. So we looked at all the different areas in transitions that could pose a challenge or a difficulty, or maybe that it could be an experience that students could draw from. So we used different stimulus and resources that they could identify within themselves, some key areas that they'd like support with, or some key areas that they found they had developed themselves. And I think there's lovely activities in there, which Billy might take you through in a while. Um, let's see. The next, next area is executive functions. And executive functions was identified because this is the planning and the organization. It's working memory. It's all those really core features that um, we found that may need to be supported in autistic students. Um, and they're really, really important for developing and fostering independence. So we identified different areas within executive functioning. 
And I've included a lot of top tips and a lot of kind of identifiers within there to help um, the guide on the side for the autistic student to look at different areas where they might need support and there's different strategies. Now, we never identified anywhere in this resource a typical age or a bracket or there is no box that any autistic student should fit in. So it's wherever the student is comfortable themselves. And that's really important because this was based on the learning needs of those students. So what a, it doesn't matter what type of visual support that they are accessing. It's the fact that they're being supported using the right visual. This was really important. So I hope you brought that across, that message. Um, and you'll see different strategies throughout executive functioning, the organization, the school bags, the task analysis and breaking it down for students and how important that can be to just to make life a little bit easier. And I've given you lots of guidance in there and there's more in the QR code, so don't forget to click them. Um, so these are some lovely activities that we'll be highlighting in a while. Um, the next area was communication and social skills. And this is one of the fundamental areas that is identified for autistic students. Um, and into that we brought in the joint attention and the listening skills um, that Imer was talking about earlier on. And we tried to keep in tips that would help anybody, whether you're working with a student at home or in school, help to identify different areas that they might need support in and how they can be explored. And I was very keen to include in this social imagination because very often we can kind of, a true no fault of our own, it seems that autistic students don't play for some people. However, they do and they play in very different ways and using that as a skill and a strength is really, really important. So I wanted to include different types of play in there so that you could help or the autistic student themselves could identify, yes, I'm really good at this and this is what I like and this is where I, I, my skills are and use those to develop. Um, more communication and more social skills. Um, the next area that we identified was self-regulation, sensory and emotional. And this has become a really, really big buzzword with the autistic community. Um, and we can see the impact that it has on our students. And we felt that including this at a time of transition when students could be dealing with different emotional regulation issues or that change could interfere with their sensory system and different ways that it could impact on it. I thought this was really important to have in there. So this idea of maybe including a sensory diet or any of those aspects and how we can feed into um, self-regulation for students or how they can identify it themselves will help to bridge that gap even if they're overwhelmed in any way with the transition back to school. Um, I've given you some tips inside there. There are some uh, checklists and different things that you can use, especially when you scan those QR codes um, that um, you can prepare in advance so that you might be able to identify areas that the, the student might need help with or that the student themselves can do. So that's self-regulation and there's social emotional in there and there's different um, key ideas within it. Um, and then we had motor skills and we identified motor skills uh, because these can present a challenge, but they incorporate an awful lot of um, the daily living skills that we associate with our students. So students coming into school especially transitioning back might have uh, challenges in fine motor or gross motor or crossing the midline. And I have all those details explained in the document, but you will also see tips and uh, ideas of what you can do to support the development of this within the student. So when you think of different, different tasks like tying buttons, tying shoelaces, zipping across zips, the coats, the jackets, all of those um, can have an impact on students' independence and when they come to school and there's loads of um, ideas within them to so develop these ones and gross motor and fine motor and the relationship between them. And the last area I identified was self-care and we saved this to last because I think this is really, really important. Um, well-being and student well-being is um, a really important area in our, in our schools and in our curricula at the moment and having this identifying different areas where we can support students with self-care was really important. Um, we worked, we brought in areas like imitation skills and communication and sensory and motor and self-care incorporates all of the ones that we have just identified way back along. So it kind of brings the document together uh, very nicely in the end. So I think I have taken you through the whole thing. Don't forget to scan QR codes and get uh, more, in, more information and more ideas. So thanks, Milu. Thank back you so much, Maria. What we really wanted to do now was take you through each section and the relevant author of each section to really maybe just share with you a couple of key tips that you might like to try yourself or maybe speak to one or two of the activities that, that we've outlined. And where we want to start is strengths-based approach because I think when I've been having conversations with a lot of people about the return to school, 
words that we hear straight away is he won't be able, he can't cope. This is going to be so difficult. And we completely recognize all of that. But I think too often what we don't do in the autism is stop and think about what is the person good at and how can we use those strengths to enable that transition and make things easier. That's something very central to this document. That's why it appears right as the very first topic that we explore. And I'm delighted to introduce Biddy Redmond. Biddy is actually also, along with Hannah, coordinating our autism friendly schools program across the country. And this strengths-based approach is something that we've been driving for a while. So Biddy, you're very welcome. Thanks very much. It's lovely to be here tonight. And again, it's great to be involved in a project like this. And I suppose as a, from a perspective of a secondary school principal, I suppose there's a few things I want to name really importantly at the beginning. This is a guide to formulate a conversation with, between the young person and whoever's supporting that young person through this resource. There are absolutely no right answers on any of this. There isn't a correct answer belonging in a correct place. It's whatever the perspective of the young person is, and the wealth of the resource is that it becomes something very personal to that young person. It becomes an example of their strengths, their abilities, their skills, some of the challenges or concerns that they might have. And my biggest concern as a school principal would be that you will do wonderful work like this over the summer and not share it with your school. So it's very important that when you do this work, whether it's even in my case, if you were taking a photograph of a page like the first one I'm going to show you, you took a snap of it on your phone and sent it in an email into the school so that the SEN coordinator has the information. You might decide and we designed the resource in such a way that if you don't have access to print the materials, every single worksheet can be redesigned on a blank page or on a copy book page. Or you might take a copy book page and create your own scrapbook of the resource as you build it over a period of time. So you don't necessarily, you can access it online, you don't necessarily be, need to be able to print, but we put a lot of additional materials there as well. So I'm gonna very quickly bring you through two sections looking at the strengths-based piece and some of the resources and some of the resources on transition. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen just to emphasize a few points there with you for a second. So the first one we're going to look at here is the section on st the strengths-based approach. And in, in these worksheets, they're really simple. They're about guiding a conversation. So with the first one here, we have a list of strengths, things that a student might be good at. It doesn't mean that they're not going to have a challenge, but usually I can find the skills that they need to navigate a challenge if I'm aware of some of their strengths. So whether it's having a conversation, starting off by highlighting the different sections, asking the student to pick maybe at least four or five, or I might often say to a student, I want you to circle at least half of those that you think you're good at or you might you feel that you, you enjoy doing. And then within each of those, it could be that I make a poster with their particular skills on it. I might write them separately on cards. If the student enjoys working on a computer, I might let them type out the list, create them in different fonts, print them out, depending on, but it's really around formulating a conversation around, these are the things I am good at. There are plenty of things that I might not be so good at, but there are plenty of things that I'm good at. And that you can, now you might keep going back to this page. As you're doing a section like self-care or self-regulation, or you're looking at organizing your work for the school the next day in executive functioning, you might go back if they're stuck and say, well, go back to your strengths page. What are the things that you did there that were really effective? Are there any skills there? For example, they might have said, I'm really good at playing video games. Well, if you're good at playing video games, you're good at concentrating, you're good at staying on task, you're good at, if you don't win on a level, you'll go back and do the level again, so you're persistent. So you have a lot of the skills there that you'll be able to transfer across. So the next sheet there in class online, it really helps me when the teacher, I find it difficult to learn in class or online when that kind of a conversation is really helpful for the student to explore around the challenges they've faced prior to COVID and being at home and going back into school. And that kind of a page can be extremely helpful to the school when you're back when, you, when the student is going back to school to help them navigate that return. Also things like all about me. And for some of the work in mentioning now, we're gonna talk about transitions. It's important to remember transition isn't just for the students who are going into primary for the first time or going into secondary for the first time. Transitioning from first year to second year, from second year to third year, from fourth year into a Leave and Cert program. There are transitions across the entire spectrum of school life specifically now transitioning back into a school post-COVID, thinking about how the environment might change, if I've got very comfortable and, and safe and secure in my world at home, 
transitioning back into school can be quite challenging. So sometimes you might start a conversation with one of these worksheets and go back to it again and again, or look at it in a different context or at a different moment. Some of the work around transition, and it's important to mention that when you use the QR codes, in each of these, we have seven, eight, nine additional worksheets because we, we weren't able to fit them all in the book, but they're all available as separate downloads on the website. And for example, in, in the transition area, we have separate, separate sheets looking at using my school journal, talking about school, returning to school, reconnecting with my, my, the students that I, I was involved with before, looking at my thoughts and feelings about going back to school. And in many ways, the resources around guiding a conversation, there is no right answer. The right answer is the answer that the student comes up with. And it's very important that as you guide that, you don't just do them as individual events. You can revisit them. You can go back and explore that work again. And the what if is a really interesting one. What if when I go back to school, I don't see enough signage? What if I walk into school and I don't see hand sanitizer? And by asking, the, allowing the young person to generate the what if question, you can start to get a sense of some of the areas that they're more concerned about. And remembering that as school principals and as teachers across the system, it is our role and responsibility to do our very best to make sure that that student transitions well back into school. And if that means you need to be communicating with us, sharing information, please do so. It is a huge advantage to me if I have an increased awareness of any adaptations, changes, strengths, new skills, new anxieties or worries that the young person has coming back to my school, because then I can at least preempt as much as I possibly can to support them. So there's a lot of additional materials there that you can look at, but I'm going to hand over now um, to Margaret, who's going to look at executive functioning. But again, I really encourage you to use the QR codes and to remember these are not one-off activities. You could revisit each of these sheets over a number of times, because sometimes we need to reteach re over and over again to really engage with the concept. So thanks a million, and, and thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much, Billy. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Margaret Egan now. Um, Margaret has been a friend of As I Am's for some time and also contributed to Autism from the Inside Out, which is another great publication uh, that Mary I produced that actually supports the work of As I Am. So it might be something that people are interested to look up after tonight. Um, but Margaret, we'd love to hear your top tips when it comes to executive functioning. You're just muted, Margaret, at the minute. There we go. Hi, everybody. Lovely to be here with you all the, uh, this evening. Um, I see we have quite a crowd. I'm just going to share my screen now and hopefully that it comes up there at uh, the page that I wanted to come up at. Are you with me there now? We are indeed. Okay. So as we've all said, as all my colleagues have said here, um, the resource adopts a strength-based approach. And uh, while each um, autistic student is an individual, we are all individuals. Um, Billy and Maria know that if they teach one child with autism, it is one child, it is one autistic child. But that said, many autistic students have strengths um, they like rules, they like sequences, they think visually and they think in detail. So as the guide on the side, I want you to really capitalize on those strengths. We all find a transitioning back to routine difficult. Um, it causes us all anxiety, but such change can be particularly difficult for the autistic student because many experience challenge, challenges um, related to what we call executive functioning. So executive functioning goes on in the frontal lobes of our brain and it's really the project um, manager, the project planner. Um, it's responsible really for key uh, school related skills such as paying attention, 
staying on task, working memory, planning, planning the day, the lesson, the task, organizing and organization. So organizing my bag, having the right equipment, having the right books, adapting to change. And as we've all said here, the biggie at the moment is the change from being homeschooled uh, back into school. Um, some students will, as Billy said, be maybe have found a little comfort zone at home. So the transition is going to be difficult. It's not going to take a day. It's going to take more than a day. It's going to take more than a week. But we go as the guide on the side, we go with the student as the teacher in school, the teacher in school will go with the student. Executive function as the top tips highlight there, um, you know, those lovely little mustard colored windows are so important. Um, executive functioning is really about self-regulation within particular contexts. We really listen to the voices of autistic students and their families while we were co-authoring this resource. I'm thinking of you, a mom who said, I'm looking forward to my son having more routine and structure. And you're spot on, really right. We all like predictability. It gives us a sense of security, of control, which is so important for your autistic child, for the autistic student. A predictable environment lessens our anxiety and it allows the student to use appropriate executive functioning and to tap on strengths, if that makes sense. One of you young students um, told us how you hated doing the school stuff at home. Well, we really understand what you're saying there and we actually understand why you're saying it. Um, consistently, school draws on rules, sequences. It is structured and routine uh, and routine, which can suit you as an autistic learner as it enhances executive functioning. This section of the resource, that I'm just flicking through here really, this section of the resource supports and develops um, executive functioning through the use of visual schedules, which visually map out the day or sections of the day. Mapping out tasks. I start here, then I'm going to do this, and lastly, I'm going to do this. Visual schedules that map out a series of tasks, and you can see visuals that relate to first, then. Visual schedules mapping out what happens when I need to go to the toilet, when I need a break, when it's sus time or lunch time. Social stories can further support executive functioning. It, you know, social stories is that outside voice that we usually associate with the inside voice. And these stories can walk us through social scenarios and they can forecast change, all of which lessens anxiety so that our executive functioning is functioning more appropriately. Top tips are really useful windows throughout the booklet and bring us nicely along to that other block called Scan Me for much more resources, as everybody has said. So we see the school bag there. Again, that visual of a conversation, to have a conversation, as Billy said, about what do I, what must I remember to take to school? What will I be bringing home from school? And don't forget um, my lunch. So finally, just um, I am just finishing off there by saying, Task analysis is basically what we in the education world, um, a phrase we use for breaking down tasks into achievable chunks. And again, visually supporting those chunks so that the task can be um, achieved. These visual supports and organizers checklists develop executive functioning, providing structure and routine, allowing the, the autistic student to feel in control the autistic student will function better in predictable environments and predictable contexts. Also, engaging with this resource is engaging with another, a another person. Um, so it actually enhances social skills. 
which I think, Maria, you are going to come back again now to talk about social communication and social imagination. Uh, cheers, Margaret. Yeah, I'm, I'm back in there. Um, just open it up. So I'm going to take you through um, social communication and social imagination. As I said earlier on, um, this was really important for us to incorporate into this because this resource is supposed to be an impetus for students to have an opportunity to express themselves and to communicate their worries and their anxieties or their excitement, their emotions, all of that. Um, so social communication is a really, really important part of that. Um, and within this, you will see, again, the top tip sections give really practical strategies um, of how we can incorporate social communication into the daily lives of students. Um, and sometimes this area causes an awful lot of overwhelming anxiety for, for the parents and for the teachers uh, working with students because it's such a fundamental need um, that, that ability to communicate and engage and it comes from those joint attention skills and sometimes we need to take a step back look at the strengths that the child has go back to that again and see what they're really good at if it is joint attention are they engaged with me do I have a platform to start with break it down into very small tasks and build on those strengths from there um, you'll see that being very, very clear with your own language and pairing it right back, provide wait time. Eva talked really, really extensively throughout this about listening and being that really, really key listener is very important for developing social and communication skills because sometimes we are, by our own nature, we jump into a conversation or we provide the language without providing the waste time. So giving them time to process, giving your students time to process information or develop those questioning skills within themselves and, and using that opportunity. Um, and opportunities prevent, pre present themselves in very many different ways. And that's why play is in there and is in there a lot. And we, we highlight play throughout it. And play spans across all age groups. Um, it's not necessarily just for younger children. Um, we play throughout our lives, even as adults, um, in different ways. So there are different types of play included in here. And supporting students in play is really, really important. But sometimes we take it, and I know being very guilty of this as a teacher myself, we use it as an opportunity to teach or to assess. So rather than take that, I mentioned within this about coaching students through play. And when you coach a child, you provide language alongside the child. You are a partner in a relationship is more important than being a teacher or a dictator or somebody that's driving a situation you're allowing the student to facilitate their own play and to communicate with you in a way so giving them away time and being a coach alongside a student i'll give you an example if you're playing with lego um we very quickly go to the mode when we see students playing of saying oh well what color is that brick or or I, I see how many bricks do you have in your hand? Or, oh yeah, are, are you using this brick? Are you making something? So we're questioning, we're driving that. They are demands that we are putting on play. We're demanding information. So rather than that, if we could uh, approach it like a coach where we sit and engage and we play ourselves, so we'll provide language. So we can say, oh, I'm going to build a tower and I'm gonna use a red brick and a blue brick. And then I might put on a third brick and that might be black. So we're using the language and providing it, but in a very user-friendly way. So those tips are in there on providing opportunities for really, really valid communication um, in different ways and looking at the strengths that the child has, using modeling, using role play and engaging with role play. And it's really nice and I used it myself um, as video role play. So recording the students with an iPad or giving them the opportunity to record each other in play is a really, really worthwhile experience because it provides uh, really valuable information for the student and for the, the person who's facilitating it. Um, and we all have phones and we all have iPads and, or whatever devices we have available that we can facilitate this. Um, providing scripts and social stories like Margaret spoke about earlier are also really evidence-based practical ways that we can develop social and communication skills within our students. Um, and you will see there are top tips throughout. <laughs> um, these are the strategies and worksheets that you can use that provide those conversation starters, as Billy spoke about. 
um, like developing an app and they're very age appropriate to uh, different levels of uh, students and different abilities and age ranges um, and giving them an opportunity to build up their own communication profile. So I hope that we have uh, included a lot of that and make sure you scan those QR codes for more information. So thank you very much and hand you over. Thank you so much, Maria. And next, I'm delighted to introduce my colleague, um, my long-suffering colleague, she gets roped into all our education programs, um, Hannah O'Dwyer, Education Officer, who's going to talk to us a little bit about self-regulation, which is definitely a topic that a lot of the queries coming to the office are centering around. So we look forward to hearing more. Thanks very much for that introduction, Adam. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you now um, so that you can see the self-regulation piece. Can everyone see that? Yeah, great. Yeah. Super. Um, yeah, so um, I was involved in writing the piece on self-regulation, um, looking particularly at sensory regulation and emotional regulation. And just for anyone who um, may be unsure, even just to reiterate, self-regulation is our ability to present a controlled behavioural response to a stimulus in our environment, whether that is a sensory stimulus. So, for example, a particular sound, a particular smell, a particular texture or an emotional stimulus. So, for example, how I react to a situation when I am anxious or when I'm upset or when I'm angry. So throughout this section, um, we input a lot of different strategies. You can see some of those down here. Um, so we have a, a different type of calming strategies and also alerting strategies. And calming strategies would be used more for um, an autistic student who may be hypersensitive within one sense or, or in general. Um, and they're things for, for helping them to, to calm those, um, the, uh, the, that overwhelming um, experience and then alerting strategies um, would be more for uh, somebody who was hyposensitive um, again in a particular sense or uh, in general uh, to give them kind of more um, positive uh, sensory stimulus. We also have our top tip box in this section as well like across all the sections and um, uh, one thing that you'll see across most of the sections is the use of visuals and this is absolutely key really when you're working with autistic students and here it, um, it explains about using visuals um, when you're preparing a strategy um, with a child but also very helpful to use visuals if a child becomes overwhelmed in a situation because quite often when an autistic um, person gets very overwhelmed they can often lose their ability to speak so it's very helpful if you have visuals to communicate with them and they also have visuals to communicate with you using relaxation boxes and allowing the student to be involved in the creation of their relaxation box so that they have autonomy over it and um, providing a choice board to remind them of the strategies that they have in their toolkit so to speak um, but also um, choice boards visual choice boards can be very helpful as choice can be a very abstract and overwhelming um, concept for autistic young people so it's helpful to have the visual there again and creating sensory friendly spaces and quiet spaces where if a person becomes overwhelmed either sensorially or emotionally they have a space um, to to regulate themselves and to practice those strategies and further develop those skills You'll see also that across a number of sections, we had some input from a number of schools around the country. These were schools that were on the Autism Friendly Schools project that myself and Billy co-managed this year. And in the self-regulation section, and um, there was input from Galway Educate Together Secondary School. So you'll see some examples of um, um, activities and resources that they use with their autistic students, and they can be uh, very easily adapted and they're very well explained as well. And then just the activities at the back um, are, there's one on um, creating a sensory profile, which again, it was mentioned before, it's so brilliant for teachers and other school staff to have that information on a student. Um, it's very reassuring, I think, for the teacher, for the parent, for the student, for everyone involved to know that the teacher knows all this information. Similarly on emotional health, and then I did see in the comment box that someone said they really liked the emotional thermometer, which I was delighted to hear. Um, so I'll just explain a little bit about how to use that. Um, it can be for any particular feeling, it can be for anger, it can be for anxiety, it can be for upset. Um, you can 
photocopy it, take a picture of it, make as many copies of it as you want. And the, the student would fill it in themselves and it's numbered on a scale from one to five. And they can look at it and identify where they are on that scale with that particular feeling. But the key point with that is to ensure that they know that it's at number three that we employ a strategy. We don't wait until we get to number five and we employ a strategy at number three to help us not get to number five or to, to help us along that route. And there's QR codes in this section as well, which will lead you to a further bank of um, resources on the Back to School Hub. So um, definitely use those as well. Um, thanks so much for listening. And I will pass you over to Leisha, who's going to speak about motor skills. Thanks. Um, I had the privilege of working with Maria on um, this section on motor skills development um, and in the book that we define motor skills as the controlled movement of part or parts of the body to achieve a certain goal. So that might be to do something like put on our coat. As Maria mentioned earlier, motor skills are important for a range of everyday uh, tasks. They're important for drawing, for writing and for a lot of playful, recreational and sporting activities that students will like getting involved in as well. So our top tip for supporting motor skills development is to look to design activities that are meaningful for students and that are playful and that reflect their interests. So for example, motor skills, both fine and gross motor, can be nurtured to everyday household activities, such as maybe hanging out the washing, cleaning windows, sweeping the floor, setting the table, and then to look at how we can make other activities as playful as possible because we know when activities are playful that it increases motivation and it sustains engagement. So if we take physical um, play for example, students will have lots of opportunities to run, to jump, to hop, to catch, to throw, to dance. Um, all really important for gross motor um, development. Also games, games such as Simon Says or Animal Imitation games Games are really helpful for gross motor skills but also support um, social interaction and communication. They can be tailored to individual students abilities and also they can the level of challenge can increase as the student gets experience um, with that particular game. In terms of fine motor um, skills when we look at play we can look at construction play with bricks and blocks, we can look at trading activities maybe something simple like treading penne pasta um, and using materials such as play-doh or therapy where we can hide you know small objects like pegs and pegs and bricks so they're just some examples of activities which again are meaningful and playful support motor skills development and you'll find um, lots more exciting activities in the booklet and in the online resources so I'm going to hand over to Anne now who's going to talk about self-care Good evening, thanks Alicia. Uh, yes, I'm just going to briefly go through there, I think, um, the self-care. I'm not going to share my screen now because of, of time or whatever, but um, I think one of the key things actually for uh, young people uh, going back to school will actually be the transitioning and getting back into that routine. And some of the activities um, that are developed um, in the resource I think will be crucial in fact in reducing the anxiety for the students as they return to school. Uh, one of the key ones there is on page uh, 45 it's um, of the booklet and it's the morning routine and basically you know it's just laid out in point form and there's a clock there and it's definitely one that you can dip in and dip out of over the next number of weeks as you're preparing um, your young person to go back to school. And it deals with things such as, you know, what time you have to be out the door at, what you have to have in your bag, how are you going to make sure you have everything in your bag and what happens if you don't? You know, how are you going to manage that if you go to school and you've discovered you forgot your PE gear or your ingredients for class, etc. And I suppose under the whole um, umbrella of the self-care, you also have that whole area of well-being. And because we have been, I suppose, in lockdown, they've been out of school or whatever, a lot of our young people have actually been maybe spending more time on screens. 
So on the QR code uh, for the self-care section, there are actually some lovely activities for you uh, to work with the young person around screen time, how they've been using it. And maybe also that's a transition piece as well for them, that when they'll be leaving, being at home all the time and maybe being on it for a number of hours to then being back to school. So there are two particular ones there. And one of them actually looks at the positives of, you know, what has screen time given us, you know, during this time. But then it also looks at, well, how have I been managing my time there? So that's probably a really useful one, in fact, um, to start over the next number of weeks as we get ready to go back to school. Um, one of the other ones then was in relation to my lunchbox and what will that look like? And again, giving the student the choice, what will I put into it? What do I like? And also building up those skills. Um, on the story time then, um, another one that's, that's on the QR code is with regard to um, the toilets. And maybe this is particular for um, secondary school students. And you know, if, if they like the rules and the routines and they know the rules that have been set by the principal about how many should be in the toilet, social distancing, et cetera. And if they come across a situation where this isn't the case, how will they manage it? How do they react? So it's giving the student, the person, a chance to actually talk about how will I manage this situation you know um, so there are just they're just some of the activities that I think will be very useful over the number of weeks and um, again like everybody else has said they will be ones that you can revisit depending on the context of what you're actually talking about um, with the young person in fact um, so I'm going to leave it at that now Adam and hand back to you Thank you so much. And while we've all been talking, some really fantastic questions have come in um, that I've grouped together. And if we could just spend another couple of minutes addressing those, it would be fantastic. Needless to say, when you bring a group of people together from counties like Kerry and Cork and Limerick, we were never going to finish on time. Um, so uh, we're, we're, we're running ever so slightly over, but I just want to begin with just a couple of really basic things. We're getting lots of questions about where can we get the resource. And as we said at the start, you can get the resource in super value. Uh, across the country. It's also available on the SuperValue website and, and our own website, but I'm putting a link to the SuperValue website into the chat now because if you visit there, what you'll also be able to access is some of the other materials as I am has actually developed with SuperValue over the last period of time, such as how we can use special interests to support us at the moment, and um, how we can tackle boredom during what might be a difficult summer where we're not getting away or we're not being able to do some of the activities we usually do. So if you haven't been to the, the, the hub on the SuperValue website, I'd really recommend you do that. And you can check that out and that link is now in the chat. Um, also some questions of summer provision. If this is an area you're having individual difficulty with, what I'd ask you to do is, is email info at asiam.ie and we'd be delighted to, to signpost you and steer you on that um, further. Where I want to just get into though now is, is some direct questions. And there's three that I want to kind of group together. And if it's okay, Biddy, I'd like to put to you because I imagine it's something you're preparing for yourself in the context of your own school at the moment. We've had a couple of questions about the return to school and how we're going to manage that in the best way possible for um, the autism community. And to, a number of particular issues raised would it be useful to have an opportunity to visit the school or to go to some sort of open night before the school reopens? How are we going to promote social distancing without causing panic or undue anxiety? And finally, is there still any sense of uncertainty that maybe we won't return? And is it a bad idea to prepare an autistic student if we're not 100% certain? <clears throat> Thanks, Adam. Three nice little small easy questions. I appreciate that. Um, well, I suppose, firstly, the, the most important thing, if I, if I speak from a school principal's perspective, I have to keep an eye on every single student in the school. But there are some students where our normal routines and establishment back into school just isn't, not, isn't going to be enough. And some students are going to need more, and a few students are going to need a whole lot of support going back into school. Now, if that means being able to, for example, in my school, if when I have the school ready and I have signs up, being able to walk around the school with my phone and take a video, take photographs of the classroom and have that up on my website in advance is hugely helpful. Now, the majority of students might not need that at all. That doesn't mean that it's not appropriate. So what's important is if your child needs that, if it's going to be helpful and supportive for your child, what you need to do is communicate with us that that's going to be important. I've already got an email from one of my incoming first years from the parents saying, we're really worried about the building. Can we get a look in advance? Absolutely you can. 
So it's important about letting us know that these are the things you need, while at the same time as schools, we're going to be trying to navigate a very new environment for us. The other thing to remember is that schools are being guided by management bodies and we're taking advice. So I'm not sitting in my office deciding what I'm going to do. I'm being guided by advice. Now that advice is getting updated on a fairly regular basis, but we absolutely hope to be back as normal in September. What there might be is a little transition phase. Now that transition phase might last four or five weeks where we're doing some blended learning. So exploring the concept maybe in the what if page, what if for the first month we're in a few days and not in other days or we're in mornings and explore how the young person feels about that. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. That doesn't mean you can't have the conversation. But if the conversation is causing anxiety, what I do is maybe communicate with the school in August about that. Get in contact with the school nice and early in August and let us know what those concerns are. So for example, when I think about the number, and, and I have a considerably high number of students in my school who, who have autism, and I'm particularly aware of making sure that the additional needs like sensory needs, visual needs, and um, all of those things that I need to be cognizant of. So communicate with the school, whatever your child needs or would support, make sure that you at least let the school know what they are. Now, if by using the resource, that means you can take, you can create your own little workbook that you might photocopy or photograph or snap and send into the school. These are things that will help the school. Remember, it isn't you on one side and us on the other. We're doing this together. And the more we work collectively to support the young person, the far more likely it is that they're going to have a, a, a more meaningful transition. But that doesn't mean that when they're in school, there won't be hiccups. There won't be areas that you think, oh, that didn't really work very well. Or for me, I notice every time I see the color yellow now, I'm thinking of COVID. So even looking at that color impact and how that sits in a school. So it's very important that you communicate the needs of your young person with us. And then it's our job to do our very best. Doesn't mean we'll do it right all the time, but it means that at least we know what you need. So seeing the school in advance, visiting the school in advance, getting photographs, they're completely, absolutely appropriate. To be honest with you, most of our staff are gonna need that as well. They're gonna to want to have a sense of what are they walking back into and what does it look like? Um, and also really about, in relation to the changes, we'll be, we will absolutely be guided and, and, and we'll be advised. But remember, contact a school. We'll be back in schools in early August. So make sure that you're communicating with us as best you can around those needs. Thank you so much, Billy. Uh, Leisha, one question we've had just relevant to the motor skills question was, how important will movement breaks be in terms of the transition back to school? And would you have any advice on how they could be introduced to the school day? Yeah, um, I think um, movement breaks will be, they're always important, but probably even more important when we've been out of, um, out of routine. So um, I think you can schedule them in uh, and that's important, but I think it's probably also important that we are very observant of individual students' needs as we go through the day and even we might not have planned um, to have a movement break but perhaps it's what the student needs right here um, right now so I think flexibility will be important in that regard. Thank you so much Alicia really appreciate that and um, another question that's just come in that I might put to Margaret if this was appropriate was just in relation to the whole area of hand washing and toileting and um, this is something that's just arisen in terms of a person having difficulty hand washing when it's not in the home environment or indeed a person who's maybe found that their toilet skills have regressed during this difficult period and um, would you have any advice around how those skills could be developed uh, for September? Oh you're just muted Margaret. Okay can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that, Adam. And um, I was thinking of um, specific situations like that when Billy was talking about contact the school. I think we can have visual schedules of um, washing our hands at home and getting into that routine. But these routines are very context specific for our autistic children and students. So again, I would really encourage 
um, parents to get in touch with the school, get in touch with um, whatever the class teacher or whomever the class teacher is through, through the principal and get to see that toilet. Visit the bathroom, visit the toilet, take the photographs, take photographs of Tommy washing his hands, going through the routine, capture those visuals. Um, if, if um, I, I, I'll actually say Alex, if Alex has an SNA, the SNA is going to be just so important in, that, in this transitioning between home and school. And again, it's not going to happen on day one back in school. I'm, I'm kind of looking at some of the questions there and um, I'm just really empathizing with a the mother there because uh, a particular child is coming home only telling the bad stories. All our children come home only telling the bad stories. Otherwise they say, what did you do in school today? Nothing. We hear the bad stories and that's good too. So I would say contact the school, stay in touch with your SNA. Toileting is a basic need. So that is high priority. So getting those visual schedules that are context specific, that's really important parents. Thank you so much, um, Margaret, for that. The next question I was going to put to Emer, and it just picks up on the reference that, that, that you just made, Margaret. We're hearing from a young person who was experiencing very high levels of anxiety prior to shutdown and COVID-19 and the long period at home has really exacerbated that experience. And the person goes to school and manages okay, but when they come home then they're really distressed and worn out and shut down for the day. Can you give any suggestions around how the family could manage that and support the young person through this difficulty? Okay, Adam, thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Now, I, I suppose it's very hard when, when I don't know the child. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm saying is going to be very general. Um, and it's, 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 it's not actually unusual uh, what, what you have, you know, just to reassure the parent that this is not unusual. But I think the first thing to do is to really talk to the teacher about this and, and discuss with the teacher what is happening. And I think in terms, again, of going back to that one of those principles we talked about, this observation, really observing the child and have it as a shared observation between uh, yourself and the teacher. So that is there anything that's happening uh, before the child um, leaves school that, that could potentially be um, be 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 contributing to this because this is this is really upsetting um, for, for for any parent. So I, I think that I, I think I would start a conversation with with the a teacher because I think Billy said there and I think it's something we really have to take on board in relation to autism. There are there there's no one answer and we all have to work together to try to problem solve this. Um, uh, in, in my past in my past um, there there was a situation very a similar situation but it actually took quite a while with everyone working together and the special needs assistant and looking at that observation. And as we said in relation to this resource, this resource is for children who communicate, whether they communicate through the spoken word or however uh, your children are communicating, we can observe and we can see, and they are communicating to us um, in, 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 in the activities they choose and the way, um, in, you know, in, in their gestures and so on. So I suppose that's what I would do. I would start that communication with everyone around and also really importantly with with the child also i hope that's helpful thank you so much emer and the very final question th this evening and i'll throw this open to whoever might like to to address it and um, if fiona and our team who has a real interest in this area i know if she was with us tonight she'd be keen to answer it and certainly if, if, if the parent who's asking it wants to follow up through info at as I am .e, we can certainly signpost it to fiona but just one parent wants to know about how would this resource be useful to use for it with a child who has a PDA presentation and if there's any particular comments people would like to make in that regard so people I suppose particularly with challenges around demand and control how this document could be useful in that context. I might come in there Adam if that's yeah. okay. Um, just just from my own experience um, working with with students sometimes the key piece to help with this it's not going to be the answer there isn't one answer that fits all of these and it's very very 
um, based on, on the individual student. But looking at the self-regulation and the sensory input can be a big one here. Um, very often, and I have seen it with the children that I work with myself, um, look, it's sensory seeking with the PDA, but the, it depends on what type it is, but the squeezing and the hugging and sometimes the kissing, it could be olfactory, it could be any different trigger that's that's causing this, and it's the student could be see, seeking the sensory input and has found a way to do it. It can be PDAs, it can be the environment might be overwhelming, and that's how the sensory um, system becomes overwhelmed. So just have a look maybe at some of the sensory and some of the motor uh, skills tips and they might feed into this. I'm not really sure, like Emer said, I don't know the, the child, but it might help. Thank you so much. Um, and again, I think the, 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 the point I really want to emphasize is this resource is for everybody. It's for every member of the autism community. It's for every presentation of autism. It's for everybody in every type of educational placement. And we think you will be able to adapt it and benefit no matter where on the journey um, you or your child um, or your school um, may be. Um, what I just want to say as well is a couple of questions have arisen of an advocacy nature and Michael and myself work through these on a, on a regular basis. So it, I, I can see some specific questions around access to SNAs, access to July provision. If you can drop us an email on info at asiam.ie, we can unpick these with you over the, the coming days. Um, I was keen to hand back to Super Value before the end of this evening um, and I actually think I got a great opportunity to do it because somebody has just asked there a moment ago about the idea of Super Value having an in-store map that you could use to navigate um, your experience uh, as an autism, autistic shopper and learning to shop. That's something that we've actually done a lot of and many of them are available on the Autism Hub that I've included in the link there just a few moments ago. Uh, but I might just pass it back to Judy uh, to sign us off tonight on behalf of Super Value. Okay, th thanks, Adam. God, there was a wealth of knowledge. It was lovely to see the, the great questions coming in and the expert answers. I think um, a few comments struck me is that this isn't a resource just for going back to school. Um, also, it highlights the need of that type of expertise and the type of support that families, teachers and communities need, I think, in, in making our communities more accessible. Um, and just making life easier to navigate. Um, so I'd like to commend both the participants for their interest and their questions, because I think everybody learns through the questions um, and the great answers um, that our experts have given and, and well done. And as I said, we'll, we'll do our best ourselves to keep, keep making changes in stores and keep making changes in our communities. But today, and best of luck with transitioning back to all. I know it's a, a task that's ahead of all of you um, and hopefully you'll be better equipped after this evening. So best of luck and well done to all. Thank you everybody so much. Thank you so much to the panel for all sharing so generously all your expertise. Thanks again um, to our partners in Super Value and Mary Immaculate College and we wish everyone a good evening. We hope you enjoy the resource and we want to wish everyone the very best of luck. Uh, this summer and in the bridge back to school. So thank you very much and good evening.